This is the Monday, July 24th, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, our time machine looks at the woman behind the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. The book is for young readers aged 4 to 8, but it's about an architect that we'll all find interesting. The book is titled Maya Lin, Artist Architect of Light and Lines, and it's by San Francisco children's author Gene Walker Harvey. Since we wanted to bring you an informed discussion, we're calling up a pinch hitter to conduct the interview. He's thriller author and practicing architect Tom Grace. You may remember Tom's chat with best-selling author Gerald Posner on his book, God's Bankers, A History of Money and Power at the Vatican. Or Tom's chat with Hugh Howard, who brought us Architecture's Odd Couple, Frank Lloyd Wright and Philip Johnson. You can enjoy those interviews in our archives wherever you're listening now at historyauthor.com or stream them at our iHeartRadio channel. Tom's not only an author and an architect, he's the father of five. So he's the perfect host to speak with Gene Walker Harvey about Maya Lin's legacy. Visit Tom at TomGrace.net and our guest at GeneWalkerHarvey.com or at Gene W. Harvey on Twitter. Gene spells her name J-E-N-N-E. Her book, My Hands Sing the Blues, was the winner of the 2012 International Reading Association Children's and Young Adults Book Award, Primary Nonfiction. In addition to writing books of her own, Jean has also reviewed over 140 picture book biographies on her weekly blog, True Tales and a Cherry on Top. I'm a big fan of putting biographies in people's hands, especially young people, so that they can be inspired to learn the things that worked and avoid the pitfalls on their way to success. Okay, now that we've laid the foundation for our chat, let's hear Tom Grace's interview with Gene Walker Harvey, author of Maya Lin, Artist Architect of Light and Lines. I'm joined on the line by Gene Walker Harvey, author of Maya Lin, Artist Architect of Light and Lines. Thank you for making the time to chat with the History Author Show. Thank you, Tom. I'm very honored to be here. And, you know, it's a treat to talk to you, an architect and a fellow author. Well, it's it's an interesting dual profession that I have. And it's just kind of (laughs) interesting how the two of them actually play very nicely together in in terms of uh, process and thinking. And that's kind of what got me into the Maya Lin book. Granted, it's written for children, but I'm looking at the point of view of what's her process like and to see how she creates and how she thinks is fascinating mm-hmm. to me. So I, I'm wondering, what drew you into Maya Lin's story? Well, you know, actually, what first drew me to, to her story is the experience that both of us were seniors in college back in 1981. And so I was a senior on the West Coast at Stanford when she was a senior on the East Coast at Yale. And I read in the newspaper about the exciting news that her design for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial had won the national contest. And, you know, it drew over 1,400 entries. Um, Obviously, many professionals and architects and designers and whatnot. And I was thrilled to learn that a woman my age had won. And so I thought her design, it's so simple, but aesthetically stunning, was was inspired. And so I've always loved minimalist art forms. I grew up with a mother who painted abstract art, went to a lot of modern art museums. Um, Now I'm a docent at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. I give tours for school groups. 
So when I learned that she'd won the contest, I then closely followed all the myriad of governmental subcommittee hearings that were challenging her design. It was rather shocking to see what said about it. Some called it a black cash of shame and sorrow. Some said it was a negative political statement. I mean, I think we forget because it's so revered now. And, and so I think it might be the most popular, most visited memorial in D.C. But then people viewed it, some said it seemed like a ditch or a hole. Uh, some wanted to add a flag at the apex. But she stood firm in these hearings and really pushed to keep the design the way she'd envisioned it. So I found her story about the development of the memorial inspirational. And then I wanted to share it with children. I think, I guess I connected because of my age being the same, but also her sense of design and her courage. Well, at the time that this story came out, I was a sophomore at the University of Michigan. So I was between the left coast and the east coast studying architecture. Okay. And the thought that an architecture student could win such a significant design competition. And, you know, and when you talk about the National Mall and you think about all the monuments that are there, these are very significant national works. Yeah. You know, expressing, yeah. a, you know, some feeling or some remembrance that the, the nation is trying to go through. You've got Lincoln on one side, you've got Washington on the other side, and Jefferson. Right. And this is going to be right there on that mall. You know, so it's a very important piece of real estate. And here's a student who's not much older than I am, <laughs> you know, playing up there with the right. big boys. And right. and basically changing the way memorials like this are actually done. Right. I mean, if you, you look at the memorials that came before her and the things that came after, and she had a huge impact on the thought process of putting these memorials together. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I think they were so shocked, obviously, when they opened up the envelope because the names were all anonymous and the envelopes on the back of the board. And they were shocked that, A, it was a woman, B, someone recognized the address of of being one of the Yale dorms, so they knew she was a student, and with no experience, no background in any of designing architectural buildings or monuments or anything beyond being in a college still. Yeah, the architect of the Capitol actually had to hook her up with a professional architecture firm because she certainly couldn't seal the drawings right. to do this. So she had to be hooked right, up with they did. professionals mm-hmm. to actually finish the work and go through the construction documents of how to mm-hmm. take her artistic vision and realize it into something that could be built. Exactly. I mean, as an architect, you know, there are many steps from that design to actually implementing and having it built. And, of course, working for the government is always a fun thing to do. <laughs> a little more complicated, too. I haven't had to go before Congress yet for any of my projects, but I've gotten close. And, uh, I can't imagine the, th- the things she had to do. I mean, when I see photos of her and there's some footage of her in the subcommittee meeting, she looks so young and very female among all men. So it was impressive that she just kept being persistent. Of this is the way it needs to be. Well, she was an artist with a very strong and compelling vision. Right. And the realization of that vision is, it's striking. Mm -hmm. You know, I liken it to walking it through Arlington in terms of it's a very respectful and reverential to the people who suffered in this war. Absolutely. We lost a lot of young men, Mm -hmm. young women in Mm -hmm. that war. And I thought it was a very tasteful way to do it. Right. That was a very significant part of her design is that concept of walking down to the apex and back up past all those names, seeing yourself reflected in the names, honoring the people whose names were on the wall who are either lost or or died during the Vietnam War. And the veterans, what she emphasized too, it was for the veterans who came and saw, who had also, because it's chronological, the names, they can find themselves on the place on the wall where others who were there in Vietnam with them. So very powerful. But as you said, it, it really was a huge measure of respect and giving honor. Now, to be fair to the other memorials out there, hers is not the only one that sometimes has a tortured process from going from a sketch to actually being realized. Right. Most recently, the Dwight David Eisenhower Memorial went through an awful lot of controversy over the depiction of a young Kansas farm boy out there instead of the, the iconic general. Mm-hmm. The FDR Memorial, loaded with political impact because they show him in a wheelchair when he was very conscious about never showing himself in a wheelchair. And the right. whole controversy is right. strung up over that one. And more recently, mm-hmm. the um, the Martin Luther King Memorial being carved in China out of white granite. 
you know, there's political overtones to that. Memorials are, are not usually an easy thing to get through, so Maya's uh, story isn't unusual in the fact that there are people who will decry visions that they don't appreciate. Yes, I think you're exactly right. Well, and it's designed, it can be designed by a committee. That's a challenging process. you designed by a committee, you never get anything good. <laughs> right. You get a platypus. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. There's an awful lot packed in to this nice child's book, but how did you go about doing the research on Maya Lynn? Mm. Did, you, did you go around meeting with her or watched all the old footage? Or? Well, you know, I was so fortunate because she is such an extremely eloquent writer and speaker. So she has a wonderful book called Boundaries, and in which she not only talks about her artistic visions, but also her philosophy, her background, specific works, and of course, including the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. I read every interview I could find. There's a wonderful PBS documentary, A Strong, Clear Vision, which has a lot of the historical footage from the hearings and the development of the memorial. And I have not met her, but she sent me such a wonderfully kind and positive note after I sent her one of the proofs of the book, because, of course, I wanted to be sure it rang as true as possible. I mean, rather amazing to think that I probably worked on this book about a decade on and off when there's so few words, <laughs> as it's the children's book. Well, it's like writing poetry, so it's, it's hard to do it. It's easy to write a ton of words. You know, if someone writes 100,000 word novels, you know, I can keep going. But you're <laughs> trying to synthesize the story down to something that a child could digest and understand and still be entranced by. And it's like writing poetry, and you've done a beautiful job oh. with the prose in this oh, book. Oh, thank you so much. That means so much to me. It's been a really wonderful process. I mean, I, the more I researched about Maya Lin, the more I was just to admiration for her and all of her endeavors, including now what she views as her last memorial is an environmental, really an emphasis that she just wants to focus on her love of nature and and her concern for the disappearing habitat for plants and animals. And the title, of course, includes artist architect because she views herself, I've heard her say she views herself as a tripod, as someone who does art, architecture, and memorials. And she views it as all connected. She's utilizing her skills and interests and talents in all three areas, which I think is pretty accurate in her case. It is because she's, you know, in many ways a sculptor and she's, she's using form mm-hmm. and space and imbuing them with symbolism, right. which is right. the hallmark of art. But then this is art that people can interact with and can move through. So it becomes a space that you're in. You can right. inhabit. So she's definitely, you know, straddling one foot on each side of the line between art and architecture right. and marrying the two in a very unique, organic and original way. I have a great deal of respect for her work. Yeah. So I was very happy when Dean asked me to uh, do this interview because I, I love my <laughs> work. The, the Wayfield one is always one that I've enjoyed. Oh, that's wonderful. I think what you said about organic, too, I think that's such an integral part of her work. I think what made hers unique is it was a memorial that becomes so personal. It's an experiencing a memorial on a private, personal level, emotional level, instead of a more distant distancing intellectual level, I guess. There's a lot of visceral nature to it. And the, the nice thing about this one is it was done so soon after the event. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at the Washington Memorial, and they're trying to raise money for it 50 years after Washington died. Right. Many of the people who go there and still go there today were young men and women who served in Vietnam. And now they're getting up there in age, yeah. but they're still going. And they're, they're looking at the names of their friends who didn't come back. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it is interesting just that idea of seeing their, the names of the ones who didn't come back that they may have known or within that time frame. Because I think there was argument, too, they didn't, some did not want to put the names in the chronological order, as she suggested, but to have it alphabetical. And that would have had an entirely different feeling. Very much so. And, and the debate over the names is still going on today. Just recently, there was a, a case in which a ship that had left Vietnam, so it was out of the Vietnam War zone, um, it was near Australia, and it was actually run over by an Australian aircraft carrier, cut in half. And quite a few of the soldiers or sailors on that ship uh, died in the accident. And the Congress has deemed that it was too far out of the war zone to be counted as a Vietnam War death, so the names of those sailors will not be included on the memorial. And people have been fighting for decades to try and get these soldiers' names on there. Oh, interesting. So, I mean, there's still some debate over who right. gets included and who doesn't. Right. That is interesting. I hadn't heard about that. 
it is an ever-changing monument, too, yeah. which is unique with the additions of names or the different symbols in front of the name changing. So it keeps growing. I mean, you look at them and the other monuments that are out there, and of course, if they're to a specific person, then they're static. They stop in time, and that's what they are. Right. But you've right. got Washington, D.C. is a city that's filled with memorials to people and events, and a lot of them draw on these very classical forms. You know, whether you're looking at the Washington mm -hmm. Memorial, which is a giant Egyptian obelisk, the Lincoln Memorial, and then Jefferson Memorial was certainly draw on Roman and Greek forms. It's that very classical, you know, white marble temple to revering you know, the figure. Mm -hmm. And now you've got Maya, and she, she lays something into the ground, this very organic form. How did she go about envisioning this form? You know, it is so interesting to think of how unique her design was at the time because, I mean, it was a city that's full of classical forms, traditional interpretations, and then her design comes along and breaks the mold. It's so stunningly simple but also so complicated in that it's a that everyone has a private emotional experience to it. It's amazing to think of the story behind how she conceived of it because she was actually, I don't know if you know this, she was enrolled in a funereal architecture seminar. So how many classes are are those, right, to begin with? And then she so they were studying how people through these forms would express beliefs about death. And so she'd already studied the classical forms. She'd already been abroad in school, seen memorials in Europe. And then there was a notice posted on a board at Yale about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and, her, and the students in her seminar decided, well, that would be a good project for our class. So she started researching war memorials and she noticed some of the memorials focus more on, on a specific leader or, or accomplishment and not as much on the lives lost until the World War I monument. What I really liked is she said she felt when they included the names, felt more honest about the reality of war, about the loss of life in war, and about remembering those who served. So that really resonated with her when she saw in the contest requirements that won all the names of those missing and killed, about 57,000 needed to be on it, that the design needed to be not political, but more conciliatory, and that it needed to be harmonious with the site there on the Washington Mall. So she did not research more about the Vietnam War or the controversies. Instead, she went to the site I think it was around Thanksgiving because they've seen a, a photo of her. And what she saw was, a, what a, she said, a beautiful park surrounded with trees. And she just got this urge, this image in her mind to cut the earth with a knife, open it up, and then over time the grass would grow back and then the cut would be more of a flat surface like a geode. Her brother had a geode she always coveted. Uh, when she was growing up, the shiny edges. And I think that she said that was an image that came to her mind. So she wanted this place where people would interact and see their names and their reflections. So it, it was there was this image that came to her. And then she went back to Yale and she shaped it first with mashed potatoes. Can you believe that? And her in the dorm and then with clay. And then she drew a pastel drawing, very simple, wrote a handwritten essay explaining her vision of this piece and only at the last minute decided to even enter the contest and mailed in, I think it was overnight mail. There were some whiteouts on it, corrections. She actually got a B in the class about that. So it was a, it was a pretty amazing story behind the, but actually she has said she feels one of the most important things about the design, and she did it for the class project. She did it the way she believed it should be. She's not think, trying to second-guess what judges might think it would be. And even one judge, when he saw this poster board with these pastel drawings and handwritten descriptions, something about he, of course, he assumed it was a he, must really know what he's doing to dare to do something so naive. And a pretty amazing story of the conception. 
Instead of the word naive, I'd replace it with the word inspired. Um, I know. When you're talking about making things out of mashed potatoes, of course, I have this vision of Richard Dreyfuss and uh, <laughs> the spaceship movie, uh, Steven Spielberg's one. Right. <laughs> Close Encounters of the Third Kind, when he starts building things out of mashed potatoes and Clay trying to figure out what it is that he's seeing in his head. You know, it's, there's my Lynn, you know, carving oh, this no, thing out of mashed can't potatoes. Tell children, don't play with but it's, right? it's a very organic process. Right. I mean, she let right. the land talk to her and she was able to, you know, realize right. this vision out of it. And it's kind of a loaded question, but you look at memorials that were done before her and look at the competitions that have occurred after yeah. the Vietnam Memorial. What's the impact that she's had on these very public conversational spaces? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not an expert at all on, on the memorial contest or designs, but I guess what comes to my mind is, for example, the, the National September 11th Memorial and its minimalist design and the, the names of the deceased etched in the granite. Again, seeing the names is so powerful. It's such an emotional, personal experience. It does carry a huge impact. Yeah. I mean, you can get that at uh, right. Pearl Harbor. Um, when you go to the Arizona Memorial, you'll see the names of all the sailors, and you realize they're all underneath you right, right now. Yeah. And when you walk on that bridge that spans over the Arizona. Right. But I'm thinking of things like the uh, the Berlin Memorial um, for the Holocaust that they did. And it's, mm-hmm. again, one of these kind of mm-hmm. fields. Or even uh, the Oklahoma City Bombing Memorial with just the chairs out in the field mm-hmm. kind of thing. Right. It, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely more a modern interpretation and right. a different degree of symbolism that we're seeing. And, and arguably, you could say that she sort of ignited that different way to think about how do you mm-hmm. remember. Mm-hmm. In a way that connects it on a personal level. So I am speaking with Jean Walker Harvey, author of Maya Lin, Artist Architect of Light and Lines. Visit our guest at JeanWalkerHarvey.com or at Jean W. Harvey on Twitter. And check out her weekly blog, True Tales and a Cherry on Top, for those reviews of picture book biographies. Another friend of mine is doing uh, quite a few of these biography books, uh, Brad Meltzer, on different famous oh, right. people. And all. He's enjoying mm-hmm. working on the younger side of it because he has some children out here. When you talk about the process of these doing these memorials. I remember shortly after the Vietnam Memorial Competition happened, there was one to memorialize the mm. activities at Kent State in which four students were killed, shot and killed by guardsmen, and I think another seven or eight were wounded in the process. Ironically, one of the ones wounded is a gentleman by the name of Tom Grace. No relation as far as I know, but I'm still working on the genealogy of that. Mm. But one of my instructors at the University of Michigan initially won that competition, and his Vision certainly was impacted by Maya Lin's in terms of the low field and these things cut into it, these four niches on one side to remember the four students who died and then these other different kind of niches for the ones who were wounded and survived. And the controversy that erupted over this one of his winning design was the fact that one of the requirements to submit for this competition was that you had to be a U.S. citizen and he was Canadian. So he ended up not getting the the final victory when they realized that he wasn't. Really? Yes, that was a, kind of a, a very silly thing because mm-hmm. he did a beautiful job on the project, you know, mm-hmm. and, and won the competition right. on, on basis of right. the design, but he didn't qualify. Yes, I mean, it's so powerful, an abstract image. It's just in my mind when you were describing that. It's just minimalist, abstract, just carries so much potential for interpretation and, and your own personal connections, I think. Let's jump into the book now. The book is gorgeous. I mean, the, the illustrations in it, are wonderful, and when you talk about the clean lines and, and beautiful modernism to it, I would say the book qualifies as it's not overly done or gaudy or any of the illustrations are, are wonderful. Tell me about working with uh, Dow, and I'm not even going to try and guess how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> so it's Dow Kumarik. So first of all, thanks so much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. As I said, I worked a long time on this to really carve it down to what I felt was the essence. Um, I actually first tried to write the book as a Tonka poem, which is a classical form of Japanese poem, meaning short song, and similar like to a haiku. Mm -hmm. But I found it over many drafts. It was too confined to stay in that format. But it was a great way to start the process of crafting the story. Um, I always aim for a thread or a theme within a story. And from the beginning, I pretty much emphasized the idea of names. And so the story begins with her naming the hill where she lived when she was growing up. Nature is extremely important to her, living with her two artist parents in a home that was aesthetics were very much emphasized. And then I end the book with her working on her current and more recent projects after the Vietnam Veterans Memorial 
And I was just fascinated to learn that her last step with any of her artwork is to name the piece because she feels not until she's finished does she have any idea what the name of the piece should be. And actually, I was working with my amazing publisher, Christy Ottaviano, and it's her imprint, Christy Ottaviano Books with Henry Holt. And she has just an amazing touch as an editor, which I'm sure you appreciate with your editors, who she's a light touch, but just brings up the most thought-provoking ideas of what might need to be revised or tweaked. And she really helped me with crafting the, the ending to the book. For a writer, there are a few things more wonderful than getting a fresh set of eyes that can mm -hmm. just subtly tweak it or whatever to push you over the finish line to get you to that 100%. Because, you know, as a writer, you, you've got 10 years into this thing. You see things that may not even be there. I mean, you, you can pull pages out of the manuscript and you'd say they were still there kind of thing because you're so close to it. And to get that fresh set of eyes looking at it. And to give you some good, solid literary advice is, is a wonderful thing. And you pull together something that it reads like a poem, in my mind, I mean, the, the, the language of it. Oh. And one of the things I appreciate as, as a father of many children is that the book starts off with children. So there's here's something that, you know, if my children were younger and I was reading this, and they would relate to the little kids. Mm -hmm. And and you watch this girl grow up. I'm glad she was very young when she won the competition. Her whole span of her life is only 20 years at the time she won the memorial competition. So to show her as a child that my daughters and my son could relate to when they're seeing the child making things out of clay or you know, building things out of Legos. And, and then that's something they relate to. So there's a visual image they can play with. They're there running on the hill and the imagination. I mean, my daughter was certainly naming hills out in the backyard of our house. We had the woods <laughs> back there in the swamp with the, the salamanders and the frogs in it. And I could just imagine my daughter running on this lizardback hill with this little girl. And that, that's the kind of thing that's going to draw a kid into it. So when a parent or grandparent's going to sit down and read this book to the kid, they're going to enjoy the story of someone like them, which I think is, is oh. absolutely a must for a children's book. Oh, that just means so much to me to hear that, Tom. That's just what I what I hope for. That is my goal, to connect with children. That's why I write these stories, to hopefully inspire them and connect and them and, and empower them, you know, that let them know they can accomplish whatever they want in their lives. Well, and especially, you know, as a father of many daughters, it's nice to have, you know, a heroic story of a girl who, challenge, as you said, the, the orthodoxy at the time of, you know, daring to send in a competition to something that would normally won by some, as my my children would say, you know, some old white guy architect, because that's <laughs> what most of us are. And here she is coming in, and she's a person of color, she's like a diversity, she's, you know, and she wins the competition because she's original and thinks outside the box and, and broke the box completely right. um, to do something that is, right. as you said, is one of the most popular memorials in Washington, D.C., and you also asked about Dow, the illustrator, and of course, for a picture book, the illustrations and the text are equally important. And I cannot tell you how thrilled I was to see the first draft of her, or first version of her illustrations. I just think they're perfect. And what I think a lot of people don't realize for picture books is the author has no say who the illustrator will be. It's no different than the covers of, of non-picture books. <laughs> I have no idea who's going to draw these True. things. I just get a picture. What do you think? <laughs> I either have to bite my tongue or say I love it. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. And most of the time, not even often really, most of the time the editors also say, authors, you are not to communicate with the illustrators during the illustration process. We don't want you meddling with the with that or or you know really inhibiting the illustrator maybe of hearing another voice it's probably a lot like um selling the movie rights to right. something is you know right. you sell them and the images are their vision of the book not your vision of the book your vision of the book's mm -hmm. in the words and you mm -hmm. stop there and then you let the movie people make the, their movie of the book which is going to be how they saw it not how you that's saw exactly it. that's a perfect comparison so i was so thrilled when they um, collected Dow. We actually share the same amazing agent, Deborah Warren, of the East West Literary Agency, and this is Dow's first picture book. Well, she knocked it out of the park. I know, didn't she? And she's a pediatrician, which I love, but her creative passion is to illustrate children's books, and so she worked incredibly hard, and I got to see all the drafts and all the changes that Christy would suggest and Dow would implement. And as far as factually, I was able to 
make a few little corrections of, of when I knew an image wasn't quite accurate. So I really, really appreciate getting to have that opportunity. You know, writing a children's picture book is a collaborative experience. It involves so many people. As you know, even if it didn't have illustrations, there's all the people at, at a publishing house that are part of it, too. It certainly is not. I mean, once my, I feel it's out there in the, in the world, and, and so many people have contributed to it. And really, publishing this book, I felt like I won the literary lottery. I'm very proud of it and everyone's effort. Well, you ought to be. Oh, thank you. I mean, someone who's read thousands and thousands of children's <laughs> books because I have a lot of children. Good for you. Lucky kid. I, I appreciate a book that will entertain me. And certainly reading a story about Maya Lin, you know, it was wonderful. You look at the illustrations and you know, unlike a Dr. Seuss books, which are cartoony characters, you know, Dow had to basically imagine a real person and, and to try mm -hmm. and render that person mm -hmm. as realistic as possible. And you see this little girl grow up and she carries that, the commonality of her appearance through from a child into her you know, young adulthood as a student and then even you know, as a, an adult and practicing architect. And you just kind of see that change, you know, a little bit of hair change and everything. Right, but right. it really captures her because you see the real picture of, of Maya Lynn at the end of the book and, and you say, you know, she's captured this girl and yeah. drawn her out. And then you know, that gives you something visual for the mm -hmm. child to look at while they're being read to. And then the words, the prose goes along. So as the child learns how to read better, they can start following the words as well and you know, I think it's a wonderful teaching book. It's just oh, it's a great thank you, story. Tom. I really appreciate that. And I like the Choco Puffles. <laughs> little Choco Puffies on the bottom. Of that. These little fun. houses. And my, my eldest daughter, who is a costume designer now, did that kind of stuff. And I can remember her making all these houses <laughs> out of cereal boxes and everything else. And that one page just so reminds me of my eldest daughter. Really interesting. Interesting. That's yeah. great. I mean, that, that just brought a little tear to my eye. I was looking at it. I remember my, my, she's now 27, but I remember when she was making all these things for her little life. Uh, Elves and fairy houses and all that. And we're almost full of these things. Isn't that the best? Uh, exactly. That is so great. So you watch a creative child grow and become a creative adult. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. I'm in awe of Dow. Every page. And whenever I look at it again and again, I'm still just think that she captured it so perfectly. And Maya Lynn said the same thing. She said, I love the illustration. Well, like so many so. of us in this business, we have day jobs to go along the well. And they're thinking, here she's a pediatrician. And an artist who's done a wonderful job on a children's book that's going to be read by hopefully a lot of children. It should be, so people should go out and buy it and give it to their children and grandchildren and read it to them because they will enjoy a wonderful oh, story. That would be lovely. And, of course, it's very timely because this is the anniversary of the right. memorial. 35 years in the fall, Veterans Day. It was pretty amazing. They built it. She won the contest in the spring of 1981, but they built it by Veterans Day 1982, which, given all the controversy, is rather an amazing feat. It went very quickly. I mean, fixing for mm -hmm. doing anything in the mall. My I, my firm that I work for was just involved in completing the African American oh, really? Museum, and that took a lot longer than the, that. Oh, I can't wait to see it's that. It's beautiful. It just opened oh, up. It's everyone... gorgeous. I've been looking at the oh. drawings of it, and I was able to walk around it a couple months back, but it wasn't open okay. yet. But it's, it's oh. beautiful. It's a wonderful addition to the, the mall. Just stunning. Oh, it's very difficult to get a ticket to get in there. It's so it is. It's a, a so. big ticket item. My son and his eighth grade class just went to D.C. and there they were able to go in and kept sending me these pictures from the inside of it because you know, I haven't seen it yet other than you know, <laughs> photographs that were sent by my construction people in D.C. Oh, that's thrilling. That's, well, congratulations. That's a wonderful for the firm. Um, that's terrific. Well, I think that's all I have. I so enjoyed talking to you, Tom. Well, I enjoyed talking with you as well. I mean, this is a wonderful book, and I wish certainly wish you the well, best with it. thank you so much. Um, and hopefully it'll be in bookstores all over uh, Washington, D.C., so the people who've seen this, they can see the book and take it home with them and you know, see the story behind this wonderful monument. You and Dow have done a beautiful job with it. Thank you so much. You just heard from two talented authors for the price of one. Our man on the line was best-selling thriller author Tom Grace. If you enjoyed the novels of such titans as the late Vince Flynn, you'll enjoy Tom's Dolan Kilkenny series too. So why not check it out at tomgrace.net. And of course, thanks to our guest, Gene Walker Harvey, author of Maya Lin, Artist Architect of Light and Lines. As always, you can find the Amazon links to purchase your copies of any of the books we've mentioned at historyauthor.com. 
and we hope you will click through there, or even bookmark our URL for all your online purchases. Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every purchase you make through HistoryAuthor.com at no additional charge in your shopping cart. Please remember to visit GeneWalkerHarvey.com and check out her blog with all those reviews of great picture book biographies, true tales, and a cherry on top. You can also tweet her at GeneWHarvey. And while you're on social media, find us on Twitter or at Facebook. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview here on iHeartRadio. And if you subscribe on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.